American University in Bulgaria. The lovely Professor Danny Talk. So I've been told to, I need to wear this because someone thinks I don't speak loudly enough. Obviously not a current student. I, I choose to believe this is a magic wand. All right. Hi, glad you all came to tonight's talk, which is on witchcraft in early modern England. Um, I know usually these talks are fairly formal. You know, it's a nice researched paper, highly, highly academic. Uh, but the more I talk to people, the more I realize that what I personally take for granted about witchcraft in England, it's OK, come on. Uh, what I personally take for granted about witchcraft in England surprises a lot of people. So I've taken a bit of a step back and we're just going to talk a little bit and share a little bit tonight about what witchcraft is, what witchcraft has been, and maybe what you might like witchcraft to be at the end of this evening. All right, so what is a witch? That's the first thing, we, and yes, I said witch with a W. Um, what, what, is, what is a witch today? All right, we do have people in today's society who claim to be witches. Um, Perhaps they're people who practice certain esoteric rites that they've inherited from their cultures. Um, they may be people, um, so anyway, uh, some other modern witches. Um, some people who consider themselves witches are a member of a specific religion, a uh, recognized religion in the UK and the United States. These are our modern witches, but I, I think for most of us, uh, we, could, we could take a glance at some of our lovely librarians to see what most of us think a witch is. And, and a witch is a wonderful, fantastical role. It's something to enjoy. It's something that we love to play with, um, that we love to bring out on Halloween and have fun movies about and, and things like this. But if I were to ask you, what was a witch 500 years ago? Right? I have a feeling that for most of you, the narrative would go a little bit like this. This is probably what you've been taught. About 500 years ago, a witch was a woman who had some special skills. Right? She was a healer, perhaps. Uh, she had knowledge that other people didn't about potions and herbs and birth magic and, and all of these sorts of things. Um, she was probably a widow. She probably lived alone. She was probably a little bit older, um, probably poor. And she therefore lived on the edge of her community. Physically, she lived on the edge of her community spiritually. Right? But as a result of what she could do, she was a threat. Right? She was a threat. She was a spiritual person who therefore didn't fit in with the tenets of the church. She was a, a healer, a female healer, ooh, right? Threat to, to, to male doctors, things like this. So we think a, a witch 500 years ago is someone who is a victim, right? A victim of male persecution um, and that these, these people who were threatened by her, threatened by her in their community got together and they would decide to, to trump up some charges. Right, some trump up some charges, some, some crazy charges about how she could fly on a broom and made packs with the devil and maybe ate some babies, you know, just for fun. Um, and they would bring all these charges together. They would put together a sham trial. Maybe it would be run by a, a local fanatical religious zealot, right? And as a result of all of this persecution and this idea that she was a threat, because she was poor and had no power, she would then be executed, preferably burned alive to the great glee of people around her. And this is our great tragedy. Now, how many of you have heard that kind of narrative about witchcraft persecutions? Absolutely not true. And this is what I decided to do with this talk. Elements of that are certainly true in the sense that they have happened. Uh, they happened in certain countries and at certain times and places. But in terms of witchcraft in early modern England, totally different narrative, all right? For example, Yes, many of the people who were uh, prosecuted for witchcraft had some sort of ability to create a spell or to create a potion. So did the people prosecuting them. So did the witnesses against them. So did most members of their community. This was simply called normal life. This is how people healed in the absence of trained physicians. We don't have medical schools yet. We don't have physicians the way that we think of them today, especially not in rural communities. To create a charm, to create a potion, to say a prayer, to make a paste, etc. This is simply how people lived. Who do 
you think accused these witches? Men, right? In fact, practically no males ever made a witchcraft accusation in England. It was women against women. The accusers were women. The victims were almost always women. Instead of being some wizened old crone, you know, big warty nose and wrinkles, not like me. <laughs> Most often the, the women accused of witchcraft were actually about my age or even younger. They were you, right? Young women, usually married, often with young children. Totally surprising, isn't it? Um, and then there's that thing about we expect a religious zealot, right, to be behind this. In fact, if you're going to be accused of witchcraft in England, you really wanted the church to run the trial because the punishments by the church were far lighter than those of the court, right? The actual governmental court. And finally, that wonderful image that we have, wonderful, should I use the word wonderful, that horrifying image that we have of that idea of purification by fire. In England, this is what happened to heretics, not to witches. Witches were hanged. Not a single witch was ever burned in England. I know, I'm actually seeing some eyebrows raised. Just, really? I know. It's shocking, isn't it? It's absolutely shocking. Uh, no one in England believed witches could fly. Sad. Not a lot of fun. Um, occasionally, someone would try to bring that in, someone who had read some of the more continental uh, writings of, say, the Malleus Maleficarum or the writings of Jean Baudin, uh, some, some gentleman who had some interesting ideas about what witches could do. But these were continental writers, and when people tried to make those accusations in English, they were practically laughed out of court. Um, you've probably seen movies or heard tales of these witches being tortured, terribly tortured, in order to get them to confess. Many women did confess to witchcraft. It was illegal to torture someone accused of witchcraft. Mmm, a little bit surprising. And even King James I, some of you have met him through me before, interesting man, has some issues, some real mommy issues. Uh, he comes to the throne in 1603. I should have made that a pop quiz question for you. Comes to the throne in 1603, having participated in actual witchcraft trials, having helped condemn actual rich witches, having written an entire book on how to hunt them down. And by the middle of his reign, he's completely lost interest and moved on to other things. Right? It's a completely different world of witchcraft in England. So these are not new facts. These are facts that we've had for a long time. Right? We, we've known this. We've known the truth of witchcraft in England for a very long time. And so one of the questions that I like to ask is, you know, why don't we know this? Why don't we know, why don't we know this? You should know this, right? These facts have been here for a long time. I think it's because, uh, I'm going to turn away from Professor Lucci when I say this. History is made of stories. <laughs> don't curse me, man. <laughs> But for, for the common man, for all of us for every day, right, who are not professional historians, history is made up of stories, right? We have certain stories that mean a great deal to us, and different stories mean more, and different stories mean different things to us at a different time. And um, the witch plays a vital role in these stories, especially now, especially from the late 20th century and into the 21st century, because the witch got all caught up in... You know my favorite word, feminism. <laughs> the figure of the witch gets all caught up in second wave feminism and the history is rewritten. The history is rewritten for some notable and worthy goals, right? To create a sense of a, of a shared, shared history among women, to, to create a rallying cry, right? To create a, an ultimate feminine symbol Right? Something that you can hold up and say, this is what has happened, this is what we shall not allow to happen again. It has its good reasons, it has its excellent causes. So I'm not going to try and undermine that story, right? or any of our other stories. We don't think of witches this way today. We think of witches like Harry Potter. Right? For those of us who are sick and tired just a little bit of the technological, over-empirical, over-rationalist world that we live in. 
right? Witchcraft is a step into magical thinking. Maybe there could be something more. Maybe there's something beyond science. Ah, right, powers that we all might have. These are our stories. So I'm not here to, to undo those and say those are wrong. Those are not wrong. They serve a purpose. I'm going to give you a little bit different story, okay? A little bit different story about what the witch meant then to those people, what she represented for them. So, to do that, we got to take a step back and say, what's magic? <clears throat> Gen gentlemen, ladies who are, who are in some of my, my classes right now, what's magic? Have I got an idea? Supernatural powers. Supernatural powers, right? So it's beyond the natural, okay? Uh, give me some examples of magic. Flying. Flying. God, it'd be so great. Invisibility. I can I can smell my DC and Marvel fans. <laughs> yeah. Swords. What? Heard one? Swords. Swords. There's my medieval club coming out. Some more. Astral projection. Astral projection. He's seen every episode of Charmed. <laughs> it's another one. Time travel. <laughs> Transmogrification, absolutely. Mind reading. Mind reading, teleportation. Foreshadow. Oh. More? Simple ones. Potions. Spells. Disappearing. Reappearing. Some of my students, I think, are magicians. All right. In the early modern period, magic exists, but it's not exactly what we think of today. It's not separate from science. It's not separate from the material world. All the things that we're talking about now exist beyond science and the rational, right? Right? Telekinesis, teleportation, transmogrifications, potions, spells, energies. They exist beyond the realms of science. Well, science, I hate to tell you, my budding scientists in the room, hadn't been invented yet in the early modern period. So it was a world of what we call magical thinking. All right? It's a world of magical thinking. It's a world in which the things that we think of as science, the natural world, natural processes, illnesses, uh, plants, animals, all of that, and religion, which has its own magic of, of miracles and you know, demonic possession and whatnot, right? And witchcraft and spells and potions, they're, they're all wadded up together. You can't separate them out. Well, if that's magic then, what's a witch? Hmm? Right, okay, so a witch is, has to be someone who can do these sorts of things. But so can everyone else, right? So can everyone else. So does everyone else in this period. So then, what's a witch? A privileged person. A woman, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to give you an example of a man who was, who was accused of witchcraft, but it was, statistically, it was extremely rare. Um, even in the, the discussions at the time, the, the witch is always figured as feminine. Yeah. So be careful. That's right. I got one in the front here is ready to take you down. Oh, sorry. You can wipe their minds. Okay. A witch was something that was di as difficult for these people to pin down as it is for us right now. They didn't know either. And it remains a subject of debate for hundreds of years. No amount of biblical exegesis, uh, no amount of, of preaching from the pulpit, no amount of philosophical and metaphysical considerations, no number of physical tests. They devise tests. Well, maybe you've, you've heard of some of these. Maybe we, if we chuck them in the water uh, and they uh, don't float. Or, or maybe, no, if they do, f if they do float. Wait, which one? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, one, one of those if, is... If, if they float, they float. Don't. If they don't, they're already dead. Exactly. Sometimes. <laughs> exact, they, and actually, that water test, that's what I was getting at. The water test actually changed. It would flip back and forth, right? Um, or maybe, maybe they'll go looking for a witch's teat. This is my personal favorite one. They would look for a mole, literally a mole, and they poke it with a pin. And if it didn't hurt, oh. she's a witch. 
<laughs> Maybe you've seen Monty Python, the Holy Grail. It was on that level, okay, some of the tests. But they couldn't figure it out ever, either. The one thing that they came down to was the idea of, and we're all going to say this word because it's such a fun word to say, a witch is someone who does magic for evil purposes, specifically to harm or kill another person or to harm someone's property. And the word that they used for this and the way it was pronounced at the time was maleficia. I want you all to say it because it's just a marvelous word. It just feels good in the mouth. Everybody, maleficia. Maleficia. Sounds like you're cussing, doesn't it? It just feels really good in there. All right, so there was the idea of maleficia. So let me give you an example of how difficult it might be in this period to decide whether someone is a witch. I'm going to talk to you about a dude. Just for you, man. You're talking about a dude. His name was John Walsh. All right, John Walsh. And he was brought to trial for practicing witchcraft in the 1560s. You're going to love this guy. He's what's known as a cunning man. Right? A cunning man or a cunning woman is someone who, yes, practiced these sorts of things with potions and healing herbs and spells and things like that and was particularly good at it, made a little bit more money, right? had a little bit of a specialization. Right? This guy was particularly good at curing, curing coughs, real danger to the community. Right? Um, he was arranged, arranged for, for witchcraft um, and he was accused of maleficia. And uh, he... Um, he had the most marvelous defense because he was asked, one of the assumptions about doing Maleficia was that, of course, since you're doing harm, you must be in league with Satan. Satan. Yes. And as part of that, you probably had your very own pet spirit, who was a demon, which we would call a familiar. Very good. I already have a couple of familiars in their little cat guises right now. Makes me very happy. All right, so they said, do you have spirits that aid you in your healing? Yes, I do, he says. Well, then you must be a witch. Ah, no, he says, I cannot be a witch because the spirits that aid me are in fact not demons. They're fairies. <laughs> And he went on to discuss his fairies. He has three. They're very nice. Uh, one is white, one is green, one is black, and they run errands. <laughs> and that's what they do for him. Now, there is a bit of magic even on top of the fairies, right? Well, how do you summon the fairies? Making sure they're not demonic. Well, I light a couple of candles in the shape of a cross. <laughs> And I sprinkle a little frankincense and a little St. John's word on them, and then they come and I tell them what errand I need, and then they go get me stuff and come back. He was released. <laughs> because fairies. <laughs> Best witchcraft story in all of time. By the way, he did, he did actually share that he understood witchcraft. He knew a lot about witchcraft. All right. He discussed the fact that, um, for example, that, uh, that, that yes, witches have the ability to do great harm. And one of the other reasons he couldn't be a witch was because he said, if someone does great harm through magic, then they can never heal again, and I can still heal people. So it wasn't just the fairy defense. Though that's my personal favorite part. Um, he was able to answer questions about how witches might use wax figures or clay figures in order to put curses on people to cause them bodily harm. Um, he even knew the, the most popular manifestation of a familiar. Take a guess. What were the three most popular animal forms of those evil spirits? Cats, dogs, toads. See, some of your story gets to stay, and you get to go, yeah. Cats, dogs, and toads, absolutely. All right. So this guy, when he goes up for trial, he didn't go up for trial before anyone who had anything to do with the church. Because in the early modern period, right, so 1500s, 1600s, early 1700s, um, prosecuting people for witchcraft in England wasn't actually done by the church very often. It was extremely rare. It was a legal concern, not an ecclesiastical one. All right, and as usual, and as for most fun things in Renaissance England, uh, we have one really fat guy to thank for the first ever witchcraft laws. Who would he be? Henry, Henry, Henry VIII. VIII. 
divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, accidentally outlived him, <laughs> right? But early in his reign, when he was uh, quite active in the legal arena in 1512, he enacted the first ever witchcraft statute. What are some of the things you'd think the first ever law, we're going to lay down law, witchcraft is going to be illegal. What do you think it included? What, what was witchcraft? What was evil? What could you get prosecuted for? Take a guess. Maybe something like going against the king. Going against the king. Conspiring as a crime. Conspiring as a crime. We got treason for that. We're already good with that because you get to torture people for treason. Damaging property. Damaging property. Good choice. Any other ideas? Something related to church. Something related to church. The devil. Curses. All right. In fact, there are three parts to Henry VIII's statue. Uh, statute. The first one and the obvious one for us is maleficia. Yes, if you hurt someone, if you cause bodily harm or death to a person or their goods, remember, legal, then that'll get you, uh, get you, get, get you hanged. Uh, okay, uh, second, second part of this was defiling the cross. So you got that part right. It's something about religion, but something very, very specific, right? No digging up dead people, none of that kind of stuff, just specifically defiling the cross. And then the last one you're, you would never possibly guess, using magic to find treasure. <laughs> These are the three things that under good old Henry VIII could get you hanged by the neck until you were dead. It was not a quick thing, it could take up to 20 minutes. Yeah, so that whole not torturing people, that's a matter of definition, isn't it? All right, so this is the witchcraft law as it stands until Elizabeth I, and Elizabeth I, being the woman that she is, needs to make it both nicer and more complicated, right? So she comes up with what we would think of as witchcraft in the first, second, and third degree, right? And only witchcraft in the first degree will get you executed. The others will get you imprisoned, maybe executed if you do it again, right? Um, but the, the fun one to know about her is that witchcraft in the third degree, um, which would be hurting someone but not permanently, <laughs> um, which gets you a year's imprisonment. And if you do it again, could get you life imprisonment but can never get you executed. There's one other thing that you could do that is witchcraft in the third degree that would get you this punishment. Love potions. <laughs> if you do magic to force one person to fall in love with another, you could be imprisoned for a year or possibly for life. Keep this in mind. Keep this in mind. So many of the things that we think of as magic are not included at all. They're not included at all. Um, horoscopes, astrology, not included. Elizabeth employed her own astrologer. All right. Um, alchemists, not included. Right. Herbalists, right. Creating charms. None of this stuff could actually get you accused of witchcraft, unless you use it in order to actually hurt someone. It's a totally different world, isn't it, than, than, the, than the story that we've been told. So um, it's a slippery slope, but just to sum up this part right here, so magic existed without question for these people. Witchcraft existed without question, but they were, they were just never quite sure what it was. And they keep, they keep working on it. They keep trying to define it for another 100 years. Um, it's actually later in Elizabeth's reign that we start to get the closest thing in England to the burning times, all right, this myth of the burning times. Um, you know, massive, massive numbers of, of witchcraft trials and accusations. This happens in the 1580s. Uh, it's a time of famine. It's a time of real political concern. Again, some of you have heard this part of the lecture before. Elizabeth did one thing wrong. She didn't marry, marry and make a baby. She's a witch. No. Um, people were concerned about the inheritance. There was, there was a series of crop failures, a, a lot of famine. Of course, we have um, a series of invasion plots. We have a series of assassination plots. We have the Spanish Armada in 1588, etc. So this time of tension is when we get the highest number of witchcraft trials and executions in England, right? And I think that makes a certain amount of sense. People love to displace their anxieties onto other things. 
right? We do it as a society, we do it as individuals. Personally, when I was on the job market, I just knew that the job would come if I could find the right pair of shoes. <laughs> Did you like my shoes? <sighs> so then it was magic. I magicked you. Fantastic. All right. So people had concerns over Catholicism, obviously, right? This is the, the big era of the, the Protestant, the big Protestant revolt against Catholicism. It's, it's been outlawed in England. It hasn't been the, the religion of England for a long time. But this is when you have Mary Stuart pretty much every year trying to get, you know, Catholic powers to invade and kill everybody. <laughs> uh, I know, shocking, isn't it? Um, and that's where also it, it becomes easier to make those associations between witches and, 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 and Satan. Because, of course, if you're a Protestant and you're English, then Catholics are evil. The Pope is the Antichrist. So anyone who's doing magical things that were associated with the Catholic Church is in the service of the Antichrist, who's in the service of Satan, so they must be a witch. Right? It's, actually, it's not as, well, no, it is as crazy as it sounds, actually, isn't it? Um, you know, we had concerns over maternity, over mothering, over women's spheres of influence with the, with the rise of a cash-based economy. The second richest person in the realm after the queen was another woman. Bess of Hardwick, nobody liked that. Um, so, so there are a lot of anxieties, and, and this gets displaced, and you start seeing a lot of this coming out in the witchcraft trials itself. Now, that being the case, and coming in right on time for once. That being the case, we would expect that when James I comes to be king, that it would get even worse, right? Aside from the whole he's got mommy issues things, right? Uh, this and the fact that he's Scottish. <laughs> yeah, what can you do? Um, this is a man who's been obsessed with witchcraft for a very long time. All right. I already mentioned he wrote his own book, The Demonology, published in 1597, one of the only books that we know of that was actually written by an actual monarch. No ghost writers or anything like that. Um, but he had been involved in something else already. He had been involved in what were called the North Berwick Witch Trials. If you'd go to look that up, because the Brits are funny, it would look like Berwick. But the North Berwick Witch Trials in 1590, James had sailed to Denmark to collect his new bride, to be queen. And on the way back, his ships ran into great storms. They were nearly drowned, all of them. Well, says James, it must have been witches. They tried to kill me. They tried to kill their king. Over a hundred women were arrested and tried for witchcraft in the North Berwick Witch Trials. Many of them were executed. James himself personally interrogated one woman, Agnes Sampson, and sent her to be executed. Yes. Um, you don't want my commentary on James I and his probable lovers. That's another lecture altogether. <laughs> It would have been nice. It would have been like, psychologically satisfying, I think, if it had been. Um, so he comes to the throne in 1603. We should expect, right, everybody wants to please the king, right? We should. And in fact, no. The witchcraft trials peak in the 1580s, the early 1590s, long before Elizabeth ever dies. And until 1645, when you get this tiny little insanity in the middle of the civil wars, until then, they are on a perpetual decline. So what happened in 1603? Our story started. Our story started. The witch moved from being this historical figure, an actual person in your community that you were looking for, and she became the character that we know. Right? She becomes the character that we know. Just to, to point out, um, a couple of quick things to, to kind of back this up with facts and figures. I know I did math. Stand back. <laughs> There's a very little bit of math that I did for you today. Um, in Scotland, during the early modern period, so roughly 1550 to, eight, to 1700, roughly the same 150 years here, in Scotland, at least 3,000 people were executed for witchcraft, and they were burned. In Scotland, they burned. Right? Now that's out of a population of 800,000 people on average. 
England for the same amount of time, guess how many witchcraft executions? Population, four million. If I did the math right, it's five times. Did I do that right? Five times as many people. So Scotland, 3,000. Guess how many witchcraft executions in England? Five. Good, you're all in the right ballpark. 500. Only 500. All right, and this is where I did math for you. Forgive me for this. In Scotland, that means that on average, one in 400 people were executed for witchcraft. And in England, on average, one in 8,000. If Scotland had executed the same, at the same rate, there should have only been a couple of people who died. Right. That's the difference, and what a difference it is. And just to put it again in perspective, Mary Tudor, how many of you drink Bloody Marys? <laughs> you know she existed, right? She was on the throne for five years. She burned more heretics in five years than England killed witches in 150. Yeah. Didn't expect that, did you? <laughs> did not. So it's at this point, oddly enough, when we would expect rational people, we would expect these trials to really take off. You've got the, got the support of the king. He's really into this. Come on, we think he wrote Macbeth to police the king, right? <laughs> Instead, we get witches becoming these characters. And they, they come out in, in so many ways. We've, we've got uh, the Witch of Edmonton gets, tri uh, gets uh, staged. We get uh, Macbeth gets staged. Uh, we have all kinds of, of true testimonials. The few, the few uh, witchcraft craft trials that keep happening start to look like the story that we want. Yeah? They start to actually start to look like the, the story that we want. Here, here's a good example. Um, in 1613, right? Two years after the, the, the King James Bible is published, where he inf infamously insisted that the language be, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Right? Good old James. Right. Um, we have a pamphlet called Witches Apprehended, in which a mother and her daughter are tried and executed for witchcraft. And here are the specific uh, accusations that they went and killed one of Master Anger's horses through magic. That they bewitched his servant and caused convulsions. They may have killed one of his sons. But most shockingly, they caused his pigs to commit no. both pig homicide and pig suicide. <laughs> All right? And this is everything that we expect, right? Oh, swines possessed by demons, that's really good and biblical. You know, harming uh, the food supply, taking out the firstborn son. I mean, this is of epic and biblical proportions, is it not? And it is a mother who's passed on this evil to her daughter, and they're working together. Oh, the horror of this. And we have these again and again and again. Elizabeth Sawyer tried in 1621. Uh, her trial is so famous and so popular that it becomes its own play. If you take me in the spring, we're reading it. You'll have a great time. All right. We would like to think that with the 18th century and the coming of rationalism and science, and oh, my wonderful 18th century is here, my wonderful rational professor, Lucci, uh, we would like to think that rationalism would have brought an end to witchcraft trials in England, even the few that were continuing. But and sadly, I have to tell you that that's not true. Um, Fifty years after Isaac Newton uh, so, uh, 50 years after the Royal Society was founded, after Isaac Newton had completed his greatest works on chemistry and optics, um, in 1716, we have what we think, we hope, was the last execution, full execution for witchcraft in England. Um, and tragically, it's Mary Hicks and her 11-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, we think were possibly the last victims of a witchcraft trial in England. And they were accused, and I kid you not, this is an 11 year old, of taking, pulling their stockings down to cause a storm. An 11 year old was executed for rolling down her socks. All right. And this is after our wonderful enlightenment and rationalism and things, because our stories keep going. Our stories keep going. They don't stop with science, I'm sorry. You know, they don't, they don't stop with math. Our stories continue on. In fact, the witchcraft laws were not repealed until 1735, and then there was a new law instituted that simply made it illegal to claim to do magic at all. 
which then allowed England to persecute um, fortune tellers, immigrants, spiritualists, um, psychics, all of these people, people that we now think of as persons possibly of a different faith or simply of a different culture. The witches I started with, the people who inherited certain things from their, their families and their families' families, were prosecuted now as frauds, and that wasn't repealed until 1951. All right? This is our story of the witch. This is why she is so important, and she's so important to us today. Every step along the way, she's reflected what we want, what we need. Sometimes what we need is very, very dark, right? We're afraid, we're starving, we're being invaded. We need to have control over something. Today, she's a much brighter creature, right? My ladies in the corner are much brighter creatures, much more lovely creatures, right? Because witches are now, the, to us, the idea of play and of joy, right, and of fancy, and the idea that maybe, just maybe, there's still something that we can't explain. Maybe there's just a little something beyond science. So I hope you've enjoyed this little travel in time through witchcraft, and thank you for being very good people and paying attention. This program is brought to you by AUBG Talks. For more, please visit us at aubg.edu slash talks.